Tonight, we want to explore the mystery of this exclusively human trait and see what it uncovers, not only about language, but about learning in general and how the baby brain works. So let me start with a graph, a graph that illustrates that there's a critical period for learning a language. Look at that curve. Isn't that interesting? That curve is good news for the babies and the children up to about seven, and not such good news for us. What you see is a curve describing the ability to acquire a second language. And we have age on the x-axis, and we have language score here on the y-axis, and higher is better. And what we're looking at is the skill shown by people of different ages when they attempt to learn a second language. As you can see from the graph, from babyhood to about the age of seven, you're really good at acquiring a second language. From seven to 10, you get a little bit worse. Uh, as you head towards 15, we're still, and uh, after puberty, we're really not very good at all. So for those of you in the audience trying to learn French or Spanish or Tagalog, uh, the fact that you're struggling against your biology is to be expected. Now what I'll describe tonight is some theories about the critical period. One idea is that the critical period is age dependent. Something happens to learning mechanisms after puberty that do not allow you to learn in the way that you once did. Lenneberg thought it was the, the development of the corpus callosum. But what I'm gonna argue is, it, is a different view that it's learning itself. There's something very important going on in early development. The brain of the child is being committed. The neural networks are being committed to the properties of the native language. As that neural network grows and develops, it begins to provide interference for new languages. Because that neural network for English does not fit, is not appropriate for French or Japanese, the languages are different. So we're saying that early in development, this kind of learning that goes on, and I'll describe it as a kind of statistical learning, develops networks that will eventually make it more difficult for you to learn a second language. But I'll also tell you that some of the magic of learning in early childhood is now being applied in our laboratories to adults, and we can train old dogs new tricks if we use the right methods. We can learn also if some of the principles of early learning are applied to adults. So it's a very interesting thing to, um, to study. So in order to learn how babies are acquiring uh, a language, we have to start with the very elemental units, the consonants and vowels that make up words. In order for you to learn words, you have to know what the units are that your language uses. So on this slide, we have a little bit of, of, of a lesson about the technicalities of speech. What you see on the top are two oral structures. On one side, the simple vowel ah, and on the other side, the simple vowel ah. Look at those tongues. I'm outlining the tongue. So you can see that a simple maneuver of your tongue, you bunch it up in the back when you produce ah, and you flatten it when you produce ah. So all of the sounds of language have characteristic postures. And these postures, when you look at the physics of sound, when you actually analyze the sounds, which we're doing at the bottom, left and right for ah and ah, you see that there are characteristic acoustic patterns that are produced. They're called formant frequencies, labeled here F1, F2, and F3. In order for you to track my speech, and I'm moving really fast, I'm not going ah, e, or ah, I'm producing very fast speech. So my formant frequencies are moving all over the place. And your auditory system is tracking them exquisitely. And that's what you have to do to be able to understand the differences between words and unpack sentences. Now, this sounds easy enough. The auditory system's excellent at formant tracking. Uh, but there's a lot of variety when each of us produces ah and ah. So let's listen to a group of speakers producing ah. 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 You can hear all this variability. They all are ahs, but there's a lot of variability. You can hear whether the person is old or young, male or female. Listen to those same speakers producing ah. 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 Okay? All right. A simple task. Lots of variability, but a simple task for a human ear. Not a simple task for a computer. This is what the computer sees. 
When you actually analyze the acoustics, each one of these circles is the vowel produced in English. And inside the circle, each of those little symbols represents a particular talker. So when many talkers produce vowels, there's tons of variability. And look at the overlap. There's overlap all over. But this yellow area highlights the overlap for just two vowel categories. So if you're in that yellow area and you're a computer and you're analyzing the sounds, you cannot discern which of the two categories it belonged to. So computers fail at this basic level. Yet infants do not. How do they do it? Let's try to unpack how they do it. And more complicated still is the fact that this vowel space, this is considered the vowel space, this triangle, actually contains all the vowels of all languages. Swedish crowds 13 vowels into this space, Japanese only five. But in each case, the speakers of the language just mess them all up, and the categories are overlapping. So how is it that infants figure out which of the sounds their language uses and how to differentiate them. Well, we have our own tricks, and we've learned how to test babies all over the world on the sounds of many languages, the sounds of many, many languages. So this was a technique developed at the University of Washington, and I've used it to study speech sound perception in young infants across many countries. I have laboratories in Japan, in Taiwan, in Russia, Sweden, Fran France, Finland, Spain, and Mexico at the moment and the students do a lot of traveling. We're using the sounds of all language to see which sounds babies initially hear, and then how does that change as they're bathed in a particular language. So let's watch a baby in this Can test. Can a baby as young as six months old hear the difference between two vowels? This baby is trained to look for the toy when the sound changes. She's being distracted, so she'll turn only when she hears the difference in sounds. Ah. Uh. The key question, will she turn before the toy lights up? Ah, uh, ah, uh, e, 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 e. I think she's really enjoying herself. Infants can be trained in this task in about 20 trials. And if you do this work all over the world with the sounds of many languages, you make the following discovery. Until about six months of age, babies are what we like to call citizens of the world, meaning they can discriminate the sounds of all languages. It doesn't matter whether they come from Tagalog, French, Russian, or the languages of Papua New Guinea. They can hear all of these distinctions. And that's surprising because you and I cannot. We are simply not able to do that. As adult speakers of one or two languages, we discern the sound differences that are critical to our language, but find it very difficult to discriminate those from other languages. We're not good at discriminating the sounds of Mandarin Chinese or the sounds of Spanish. And Japanese adults have a terrible time with the sounds R and L, like in rid and lid, because the Japanese language doesn't distinguish them.